Our text is Matthew 7. We are in a series on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, We've been going section by section, studying what Jesus has to say to us as his followers, as his disciples. And this morning, we are at Matthew 7, verses 6 through verse 12. So Matthew 7, 6 through verse 12. Here's what it says. It says, Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. For which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks you for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This morning we're diving into the topic of discernment, knowing the difference between not just right and wrong, but between right and almost right. We live in a world of Disney make-believe and Hollywood magic, and we've perfected the art of making the fake look real. In a review of American fast food, Gene Shapiro wrote the following. He said, our hamburgers are made from the flesh of chemically impregnated cattle, broiled over counterfeit charcoal, placed between slices of artificial flavored cardboard, and served by recycled juveniles. And it's not just food that's fake. Rafe Esquit was a man who taught in the meanest urban areas of America. And in that hellhole, he worked hard to take throwaway kids whose family abandoned them and poured into them till they became world changers. He wrote a book called Teach Like Your Hair's on Fire, and here's what he wrote. He said, there's so many charlatans in the world of education. They teach for a couple of years, come up with a few clever slogans, build their websites, and hit the lecture circuit. And in this fast food society, Simple solutions to complex problems are embraced far too often. True excellence takes sacrifice, mistakes, and an enormous amount of effort. From the movie house, to the schoolhouse, to the White House, to the courthouse, even to the house of God, it is becoming incredibly difficult to separate truth from lies. We're seduced by news that is biased. We vote for soundbite politicians who make hollow promises, and we listen to slick televangelists who have great smiles and nice words and wants us to be thinking about our best life now and how God wants to just simply bless, bless, bless us. But they serve us spiritual happy meals and supersized cups of empty calorie soda fist theology that tastes good for the moment but does us no good at all. In fact, actually hurts our bodies. In an era of media magic, gamers can go anywhere and be anyone and perform any feat in a techno-fantasy world of video games. We busy ourselves trying to get as many friends as we can on Facebook, as many followers as we can on Twitter, and as many people to like our posts and our photos. These friends that we make and these followers that we follow, they're not really our friends. Some, some of them we barely even know, but we pretend that they are. We call them our friends. In a virtual world reality, in a virtual reality world, fake is real. It creates a weird reality. It's like the guy who's enjoying an absolutely gorgeous sunset on a white sandy beach, and he turns to his wife and he goes, this is so beautiful. It looks just, it looks almost as good as the movies. You miss the real for the fake. One actor lamented about friendships in Hollywood and said, you can't find true closeness in Hollywood because everyone fakes closeness so well. Can I suggest that the same can be said for those of us who are in the church? We fake that we're close. We're not open and honest and intimate with one another. Our lives can be falling apart, but when we ask for prayer requests, we'll say, oh, life is good because we are not open and willing to share the things that are going on in our lives. Matt Damon, the actor, said it's better to be a fake somebody than a real nobody. 
Marilyn Manson, who's a outrageous rockers who antics offend almost anyone, um, was actually born by the name of Brian Warner. But he hated that name because the name was so boring. So he took on the names of Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson. And he's quoted as saying, I'd rather be fake than real. Fake is more exciting. But what is real? You can't find the truth anymore. You just pick the lie that you like best. And as long as you know it's a lie, it can't hurt anyone. But he's wrong. Fake can hurt you. Fake can destroy you. Satan is the father of being fake. The Bible calls him a liar and a deceiver. Long ago, he was the archangel in heaven. He was the brightest star in heaven. He wanted to be the superstar of the ages. So he tried to seize heaven's throne. And like Matt Damon, he said to himself, it's better to be a fake somebody than a real nobody. And he deceived a third of the angels of heaven with him. They joined him in rebellion against God. And they agreed with Marilyn Manson that being fake is more exciting than being real. But their story didn't end well for them. Lucifer and his friends, now called demons, falls from heaven to hell. And then he brings his show into the Garden of Eden. His lies seduce Adam and Eve, our first parents, and they join him in the rebellion against God. And as a result, paradise is lost. The presence of God on a daily basis is gone. They go from rest and pleasure and enjoyment of God to now work and toil and sweat and labor because they were deceived by the enemy. And as a result, all of us come into the world far less than what our Creator intended us to be. And just like our first parents, many of us have swallowed counterfeits and lies and fakes that have turned the original paradise into a living hell. Guys, truth matters. It's so important for us to know the truth because lies kill. The reality is that Satan is too smart to come to us with bald-faced lies. He'll take a lie and he'll twist it to make it sound like truth, and then he'll present it to us. But the results are they destroy us. There's not a counterfeiter in this world that would create a $4 bill in the shape of a triangle with a picture of Oprah Winfrey on it and try to give it at a store because it would be caught. A counterfeiter doesn't copy what's fake. They study what's real and try to make something fake that looks just like the real thing. The counterfeit has to look exactly like the real bill. Satan doesn't come to us with a pitchfork and horns. He knows we wouldn't believe anything he says if he came to us that way. The Apostle Paul says that the devil comes to us as a disguised as an angel of light. Sometimes he overplays his hands and even the simplest or even the newest of believers can catch his schemes, but often what he'll do is he'll disguise his strategies and make it look so real and so good and so promising that it takes supernatural discernment for us to figure it out. Charles Spurgeon said something in the 19th century that is so relevant for us today. He said, discernment is not a matter of simply di telling the difference between right and wrong. It's a matter of telling the difference between right and almost right. The words that we read in G the words of Jesus that we read this morning could mean the difference between life and death. And starting in verse 6, through the end of this chapter, he talks about dogs that tear away people. He talks about pigs that trample pearls, false prophets, ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. He talks about wide gates and narrow gates. He talks about found, bad foundations that are built on sand that are destroyed when the floods come. All of these dangers that destroy people who don't discern between what is right and almost right. The question is, how do we, how do we discern it? How do we avoid such a disaster? How do we know what is from God and what's not from God? How do we know what is real and that brings life and joy and happiness and what's fake that looks good today but ultimately destroys us? In verse 7 that we read, Jesus says, it makes a promise to us. He says that those who seek God's heart, it will be given to you. You will find it. The door will be open to you. That is the promise from God for us. 
Our text today gives us a great principle that's applicable for all of life. The principle is this. Know God, and you will see through any counterfeits. Know God, and you will see through any counterfeits. When you truly know who God is, when you truly know what God is like, when you truly know how God operates, his character, his desires, his heart, you'll easily be able to discern what is fake, even if it looks good. You'll know the difference between what is real and what is fake. Know God and you will see the counterfeits. Go to the FBI and get training to spot counterfeit money. They don't make them study fake money. You know what they do? They take the out a real dollar bill. Don't make them study the dollar bill. They'll make them learn every inch of it. They'll make them know how it feels, the texture, the color, the touch, the smell of real money. See, when you know what is real, when you know what real looks like, you'll be able to spot counterfeit. When you know what is genuine, you'll be able to spot what is fake. And in the same way, you don't detect lies by studying lies. You don't learn to spot Satan by focusing on Satan. You learn what is fake and what's a lie by keeping your focus on Jesus, by keeping your eyes on Jesus. If you know God's heart, if you know God's voice, you can always detect the voice of the enemy. In the book of John, Jesus actually gives us the secret to avoiding deception. He says the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. They will flee from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. But my sheep hear my voice and follow me. So here's my challenge to you this morning. Will you seek God's heart until you find it? Will you keep asking for it to be opened no matter how long it takes? No matter how long you wait? Will you keep knocking on the door until the door swings wide open for you? Let me put it another way. There's a door right there. Suppose I told you behind that door is incredible treasures. Maybe it's the guy or girl of your dreams. Or it's the winning ticket to a $350 million lottery ticket. Maybe it's the car you've always wanted. Maybe it's the dream job you've always wanted. Maybe it's a house that you've always dreamed of. There's something behind that door in an envelope that says you want something great. It's behind that door. Would you go through that door? Would you, if it was locked and you knew there was someone behind it, would you keep knocking and keep knocking until someone opened for you, even if you had to pound on that door day and night? See, that's what Jesus is calling us to do this morning. Finding spiritual discernment is important. And in our text this morning, Jesus shows us three things that are inc incredibly important for us to know. First of all, he teaches us that what you don't know can kill you. Secondly, he says, what you do know, who you do know, will save you. And finally, he says, the one who knows you will never let you down. So let's unpack these things. The first thing is, what you don't know can kill you. This chapter of Matthew 7, we see Jesus reminding us over and over again that there's two kingdoms in immortal combat against each other. And it will not end until Satan is crushed at the battle of Armageddon that's described in the book of Revelation. Until then, the devil and his allies will stop at nothing to devour us. The greatest weapon that the enemy uses is deception. False prophets, sheep dressed in clothes, uh, wolves dressed in sheep's clothing, wide gates that look appealing but lead to destruction, foundations that are built on sand. Deception is the greatest tool of the enemy. They look, the way looks easy, the way looks appealing, it looks nice, but it leads to destruction. The house that's built on the sand looks so secure until the hurricane comes, until the flood comes, and you're washed away in the flood. And Jesus gives us an example in verse 6. He says, do not give to the dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. The original word for holy there in the Greek speaks of things that are set apart for special purposes. Because they have high and holy uses, they should be treated with reverence and awe. It's like holding the original copy of the Mona Lisa in your hands. You wouldn't doodle on the side of it. You wouldn't use it as a napkin to wipe ketchup off your face. You wouldn't use it as a blanket to cover you when you're cold. 
And what Jesus is saying is the gospel is more sacred than the Mona Lisa. It's more sacred than the original copy of the Declaration of Independence or any other substance of, that has great value and worth today. Jesus calls it God's pearls. Pearls were priceless in the Mediterranean world. Jesus is saying the things of God is not only sacred, they're immeasurable. Don't waste such incredible things on those who shrug them off or despise them. Do not give to the dogs what is holy. The word dogs there in the original language speaks to wild dogs that travel in packs, voracious as wolves, diseased and dirty, scavenging in the garbage dumps, looking for the lone traveler that, could, that they could devour. These wild dogs wouldn't know the difference between what is sacred and what is wicked. If you hold out what is sacred to them, they will rip it from your hands and they will tear it to pieces. And he goes from talking from dogs to now talking about pigs. Pigs were the foulest animals to the Jewish people. Swine live to fill their bellies, even if they have to do it with garbage. These pigs rush to the pearls, thinking that they have thrown them some shiny pods of good. And then they discover that you've teased them with something that they can't eat. They fly into a pig's rage, stomp your pearls into the ground, and then they turn and attack you. They care less that you've given them a pearl of a bead of pearls. They don't care what it is. They'll destroy it. Listen, Jesus isn't telling you to label people as swine or pigs. He doesn't want you to joke that I don't cast my pearls before pigs. That's the sort of nastiness that makes us ugly to a watching world. That is not what he's calling us to do at all. But he's telling you that your gospel should be so precious to you. But it is a poison to some people. Priceless pearls cause pigs indignation. The gospel makes some people excited, but it makes others angry. It can get you ripped by, to shreds by rabid dogs. So handle it with care. Treat it as precious. Treat it as gold. Don't waste it. Don't take it lightly. Pray that God will give you discernment to know when to talk and when to keep silent, when to lay out your pearls and when to pick them up and go home. Jesus had such a moment in Matthew 13. He was preaching in his hometown of Nazareth. The people took offense at his teaching. The Greek word for offense there is the word where we get the word scandal from. These scandalized people were now ready to shred him to pieces. In fact, they were ready to throw him off a cliff. Jesus responds, he says, a prophet is not without honor everywhere except in his hometown and in his own home. And in Matthew 7, verse 58, Jesus says, he, um, the Bible says that Jesus did not do any miracles in his, own, in his own town because of their lack of faith. He stopped doing miracles. He left town because the people would not care less. In short, he picked up his gospel, the pearls of the gospel, and he went to where the people would respond in faith. Listen, sometimes you have to do the same thing. What you don't know can kill you. And from there, Jesus shows us that who you do know will save you. That's our second point. Who you do know will save you. Verse 7, verse 8 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks find, and the one who knocks will be opened. All of this begs to ask the question, what is it, the it, that Jesus is talking about? What are you seeking? What's behind the door? And We'll solve that riddle in a moment, but notice first what Jesus says. The first thing he says is, go after it with all that you've got. He uses three verbs here, ask, seek, knock. These are urgent and imperative commands in the Greek. There's not a request. He's telling us you have to do this. He uses the strongest form possible in the original language. Literally, he's saying, you've got to plead loudly. You've got to search frantically. You've got to pound forcefully. Each of these verbs is in the present active tense. That means keep on asking, keep on searching, keep on knocking until you get it. Never, never, never quit. Never stop knocking. Never stop asking. Never stop seeking. Keep searching until you find it. Notice the verb rises from in intensity. Ask. If that doesn't work, seek. If that doesn't work, start knocking. It calls for everything you've got. Seek it 
with all that you got. The second thing we learn here in seeking answers, you actually find the source. Remember the context of these verses? You need to find discernment so that you don't get deceived. Life is full of riddles. All of us have requests before God that we would love God to answer for us. We are all desperate for answers from God. So we go to ask, go to God asking for solutions. But here's the thing. I think Jesus wants us to get something far greater than just answers for our problems. Allow me to tell you what I mean by sharing a story from the Old Testament about a father and a son. The son's name was a guy by the name of Solomon. When he became the king of Israel, God offered to give him anything he ever wanted. Solomon felt inadequate to the task of ruling a nation, so he asked God for wisdom. And God was actually pleased that Solomon didn't ask for wealth or power or anything material, so God gave him wisdom. See, God loves to give us more than we could ask or imagine. And Solomon grew up to be the finest or the wisest man who ever lived. But the man who wrote Proverbs became too smart for his own good. His wisdom built Israel a great empire. He became the richest man in the world. But the power corrupted him. And Solomon lost his way. He went through a midlife crisis. And the man ended up having a thousand women with him. He erected idols for his pagan wives. And eventually he began to worship these idols with his wife. He led the nation into idolatry. Solomon sought the wisdom of God, but he never sought the God of wisdom. Solomon's father was a man by the name of David. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. He spent his life in pursuit of the heart of God. Never did a man ask, seek, or knock on God's door more than David did. Had God asked David, what do you want from me? David would have responded, more than anything else, I want you. I want to know you. I want to be intimate with you. See, Solomon wanted God's wisdom, but David wanted so much more. He wanted God. He wanted an intimate and dynamic relationship with his father. When Jesus says, ask, seek, knock, he's not telling us to go after answers so much as he's saying, go after the God of wisdom. Go after the God of your life. See, we're so content to live our lives apart from the one who's made us for himself. Most of us pray when we're desperate for help. And after we get our answers to our prayer, we, we heave a sigh of relief, and then we go on our way forgetting God. Perhaps the reason you go through so much struggles over and over and over in your life is because God is trying to draw you toward him. Maybe God is trying to make you intimate with him. St. Augustine said, God has made us for himself, and we will be restless until we find him. He knows that if he answers quickly, we'll be just as quick to grab the answer and run and forget him. So he keeps us asking, and he keeps us seeking, and he keeps us knocking, not so much to tease us or frustrate us, but because he knows that it is the struggle that we seek. In that struggle, we seek him even more. We knock on his door even more, and in that process, we get to know him even better. We don't need wisdom or discernment as much as we need to know God. Oswald Chambers said, God does not exist to answer our prayers, but by our prayers, we get to know God. Someone said to Martin Luther, he said, I live my life in a state of paralysis. I'm afraid to do anything lest I find myself outside of the will of God. I'm constantly waiting on God to tell me what to do next. And Martin Luther responded, he said, love God and then do what you please. Luther is making a profound statement. When you have a heart for God and your heart is conformed to God's heart, you'll know what to do next. You'll know to, that your desires are to obey God and to please God and honor God. One writer said it this way, run after God with all your heart and then follow your heart. Number three, your search is never in vain. See, here's the good news. 
If you seek God's heart, you will find it. God wants you to have it. Jesus says in verse 8, For whoever asks, receives, and whoever seeks, finds, and whoever knocks, the door will be open. James, the brother of Jesus, puts it this way. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask. Who Ask God, who gives generously to all without a reproach. It will be given him. But in faith, ask. Do not do it without, with doubting. Let me unpack that verse, verse for you. Number one, it says ask. James also said this, you do not have because you do not ask. Ask. Second thing that verse says is God gives generously. He holds nothing back from us. Number three, God gives to all. That has to include you. He gives to all. Number four, God never finds fault. There are no stupid questions. There are no stupid prayer requests. There are no stupid needs that you can come to God with. You can ask God anything. He loves to answer prayer requests. Number five, you will receive. Remember, this has to do with wisdom and discernment. You're not talking about a new Mercedes or a dreamboat spouse. That's not what we're talking about. It's discernment and wisdom. Number six, don't doubt. Believe that those who ask will receive, that those who seek will find, that those who knock will have a door open to God's heart for their lives. When that happens, just come on in and enjoy the company of a God who loves to share his life with you. And that leads us to the fin final point. The one you know will never let you down. The one you know will never let you down. And you can almost turn that around and says the one who knows you will never let you down. Let me be honest in the hopes that you will identify with my struggles. I think there are three things that keep me from going deeper in prayer. The first is this sneaky suspicion that ultimately prayer doesn't matter. You can call it predestination called gone wild or fatalism that says that God's going to do what God's going to do because God is God. He doesn't respond to my prayer. He's going to do whatever he wants to do, right? Um, the second is a kind of fear that I'm not praying the right way, that maybe I'm not using the right words or the correct language, or maybe my words will mess up my prayers and God won't answer my request. And the third is that little voice inside that says, I don't have time to pray. I'm too busy. I've got so much going on that I don't have time to pause and sit and seek God's face. See, if you're like me, you need these reassurances from Jesus that he gives us in these passages. And he gives us five of them here. He says, the first thing is, it is God's nature to be generous. It is the nature of God to be generous. At the end of verse 8 is a promise about the door that we're knocking on. It will be opened. The original Greek here is so wonderful. It will be opened again and again, and again, and again. As often as you need it, God will open that door for you. Listen to Paul's doxology in the book of Ephesians. Listen to what he says about our generous God. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. It is God's nature to be generous. The second thing is he is, his, he is our father, we are his children. Look at Jesus' argument in verses 9 and 10. He says, which one of you, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? You'd have to be a sicko kind of father that likes to play tricks like that on your children. Psalm 103 tells us about the natural heart of a father. As a father has compassion on his children, the psalmist writes, so the Lord has compassion on his people. Fathers are a reflection of God, created in God's image. And though that image has been twisted and warped by sin, even the worst fathers are still touched with pity when they see their children hungry. Who can resist his own child when he hears, Daddy, I'm so hungry? God's our father. We are his children. Number three, father knows best. Verse 11, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven 
give good gifts to those who ask him. Notice two words are repeated twice in that verse, good gifts. Jesus is speaking on a hillside not far from the fishing villages that dot the shores of Galilee. Many of his disciples were commercial fishermen. Their diet consisted of bread and fish. Bread was to the ancient Jews what rice is to us Asians and steak is to us Texans. I mean, it is what we live off of. Fish was their main protein. Jesus isn't saying that God will always give us pizza or cake or a big house or a perfect spouse or a lot of wealth. He deals in reality, not in our fantasies. Like all good fathers, he gives us healthy food. Insecure and apathetic dads and moms want their kids to like them, or worse yet, want their kids to stop bugging them, so they give their kids whatever they want. And as their kids grow older, they spoil them with things that are not healthy for them. Parents can be enablers, and they can't believe it when their middle-aged kids are still draining them for money to bail them out of their irresponsibility. The truth is they've allowed them to develop an entitlement mentality when they were still kids. But listen, God is a good father. He gives tough love. And he comes from a heart of love. He doesn't just want to give you whatever you want because whatever you want will destroy you. He gives you what you need because he knows what's good for you. He wants strong kids that will become godly adults. Remember that the next time you ask God for a request and God actually says no. He doesn't say no because he hates you or doesn't want to answer your prayer. He says no because he knows what's good for you. I've said this before. Oftentimes, we thank God for answered prayers, but we should be much more thankful that there are many, many prayers that we've asked God for that God did not answer for us. Because if God had answered it, the way we wanted it to be answered, our lives would be completely different from where we are today. Thank God for unanswered prayers because a father knows what's best for our lives. He always gives you his time. He always gives you his heart. He knows what's good for you. Number four, the point is to grow up to be like the father. Look at verse 12. It says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. These words have become known to us as the golden rule. It's almost as if they're out of context, like a nice saying that Jesus throws in the middle of all of his statements. But they fit into the flow. What Jesus is saying is that we need to grow up and become like our Father by treating our brothers and sisters exactly the way our Father treats us that we need to behave like God treats us. To put it another way, we need to become like our perfect big brother, Jesus. Paul understood this when he says this in Romans 8. He says, For God foreknew whom he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Sons and daughters will grow up to be just like their parents. That's not only true in the natural, it's also true in the spiritual. God will not deny us anything that will make us more like Jesus. He will give us everything that we need to stay on track. If you want your prayers answered, ask him for the things that will make you and yours more like Jesus and for the sort of things that will advance his kingdom and his name through your life, and he'll give you those things. Number five, the Father always keeps his promise. The Father always keeps his promise. We need to end by reiterating the promises of Jesus. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. God's not a man that he should lie. You want proof that he keeps his promise? You don't have to look any further than the cross of Calvary. Look at the crushed son on the cross. If God would do that for us, how much more will he give us everything that we need to cross over into heaven looking just like his son? Check out the promises and the predictions in Scripture. God is still batting a thousand. He hasn't failed on any one of his promises. None of his words have come back to say he was wrong. He hasn't given you all that you wanted, 
but he has given you all that you've needed. He never fails to give you what you need to be recreated into the image of Jesus. See, we live in a world of fake. Life is full of orchid trees, full of forbidden fruit. The same Lucifer that slithered his way into Adam and Eve's paradise is still alive and well, and he hasn't lost his magic touch. He operates in a world of Madison Avenue fake, Hollywood make-believe, an empty calorie religion masquerading as healthy spirituality. The enemy of our soul makes good use of the tools of deception. But Paul wrote about Satan, we are not unaware of his schemes. The issue for us is not to tell the difference between right and wrong, but the difference between right and almost right. But thank God for the hope that we receive from Jesus in the words today, that if you know God, if you really know God, if you really are intimate with God, then you'll easily be able to spot the counterfeits. When you know God's heart, when you know God's desires, when you know God's wants, when you know God's passion and his heartbeat, then you'll know the things that are from him and you'll know the things that are not from him. So my challenge for you this morning is that you would know God, that you would be intimate with God, that you would seek God, that you will keep asking and asking, that you'll keep knocking until the door is wide open for you, that you would say, God, give me what will what you need to give me to make me more like Jesus. Give me the desires of your heart. Let my heart be passionate for you. This morning as we come to the communion table, like I said, this table reminds us that God will do, go to the ends of the earth to show us that he loves us. That God will give his life to call us his own. This table is a weekly reminder for us that we are not here because of our works, abilities, talents, skills, that we have been saved, redeemed, rescued, because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we had nothing to do with God, when we had no desire for him, when we had no passion for him, in fact, when the Bible says that we were his enemies, Jesus came and he died for us. This table is a reminder that God knows what's best for us. Because without him, we would have ruined our lives. But he came. He lived the life that you and I should have lived. He died the death that you and I should have died. He took our place on the cross of Calvary. So that this morning, we sit here not as aliens and strangers and orphans, we sit here forgiven, cleansed children of God. What a great God we serve. He doesn't give us what we want. He gives us exactly what we need. So I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, your life, your, your attitudes, your actions, your affections. Would you let the Holy Spirit speak to you for a moment and examine your own life?